Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming here in the room and also on Zoom or online. Um, I'm Richard Rand. I'm the Associate Director of Collections at the Getty Museum. And before I begin, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Getty recognizes and is committed to undertaking the work to build relationships with these communities. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. I'd like to remind those of you online that the closed captioning function has been enabled. So to access live captioning, click the CC icon on the Zoom menu bar. Um, and we'll also have some time at the end for questions. Um, at the end of the presentation, Christine and I will, will be up here. And attendees on Zoom, please use the Q&A function, uh, the box to ask questions for the speaker, and they'll appear on an iPad that I have. Those of you in the audience who want to ask questions in person will have a microphone available. Please wait to get the microphone so that the people online can also hear you. And finally, one additional note, the Twombly exhibition will be open until 6 p.m. today, so you'll have an opportunity to spend a bit of time in the show after the presentation today, and I hope you take advantage of that. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Christine, Christina Condolian, uh, from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It was several years ago that Christine came to us with her idea to organize a large exhibition of Cy Twombly, focusing on his deep and enduring engagement with the artistic and literary culture of ancient Greece and Rome. Those of you who are habitues of the Getty and have been following our exhibitions and public programs will appreciate that in recent years, um, we've been looking at trends in modern and contemporary art that resonate with our collections of historic European art. In particular, we have been especially interested in the legacy of the classical tradition and the way the art of antiquity resonates in later periods. Dr. Condolian's concept seemed a perfect fit with that vision, and we readily signed up to be the MFA's partner on the exhibition. My colleague Scott Allen, curator of paintings at the Getty, and I had the wonderful role of working with Christine to realize the exhibition here in Los Angeles. As so many things in recent years, the project was complicated um, by the pandemic. It was delayed. We ended up switching venues with Boston. The wonderful catalog was published over a year ago. In fact, it's now in its second edition, which is testament to its, its brilliance. But it has all finally come together, and we couldn't be happier that Christine is here this afternoon to present her project to us. Dr. Condolian is the George Barakas Chair of the Art of Ancient Greece and Rome at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where she has worked since 2001. During her tenure, she has produced numerous publications devoted to the MFA's world-renowned collection of ancient art, and has organized a number of important exhibitions. I'll just name two, Games for the Gods in 2004, and Aphrodite and the Gods of Love in 2011. Most recently, Christine led the renovation and reinterpretation of 12 new galleries of Greek, Roman, and Byzantine art at the MFA, which opened last December to great acclaim. I had the joy of seeing it earlier this year. Before coming to Boston, Dr. Condolian was curator of ancient art at the Worcester Art Museum in Massachusetts, and she previously served as associate professor of art at Williams College acting as chair of the department and also as acting director of the Clark Art Institute Williams College graduate program in the history of art. We have some graduates of that program in the audience and I worked at the Clark and so we share some Williams DNA. Um, that's important in some circles. Christine has been a resident fellow of the American Academy in Rome and a visiting professor at Harvard University from which she received her PhD. With all these bona fides, her perspective on Cy Twombly, a very American and very contemporary artist, is unique. Her talk today is entitled, appropriately, Reading Cy Twombly Backwards and Forwards. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Christine Condolian.
Thank you all for being live and on Zoom. Thank you, Richard, for those generous comments. Um, as Richard said, uh, the partnership of the Getty Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston has just been terrific. Boston is grateful to the Getty for opening the exhibition, and a big thanks goes to Museum Director Tim Potts for his early support, and to Richard Rand, who you just heard from, Associate Director of Collections, and Scott Allen, Curator of Paintings, for the realization of the exhibition here at the Getty. I could not ask for more collaborative and generous colleagues who were insightful interlocutors over these last years. Thanks are also due to Jeff Spear, the senior curator of the Getty Villa, for his guidance on the antiquities, um, Twombly's antiquities, that is. Um, and also, um, this project really was not possible without the support from the get-go of the MFA Museum director, Matthew Teitelbaum, who I'm pleased to say is here today live. Uh, his belief that a Greek and Roman specialist could guide this 20th century project is deeply appreciated. The loans from the Cy Twombly family led by his son Alessandro Twombly were very meaningful. Of course, this exhibition would not exist without the support and generous loans from the Cy Twombly Foundation. I'm so grateful to the board led by Nicola Del Rocio, who's here with us tonight, along with Jonas Storzve, David Baum, and to Nick Sirota for his steady guidance. The staff of the Twombly board in New York, Rome and Gaeta, were always ready to assist. London and New York Gagosian teams, led by Mark Francis and his associate Adele Minardi, were vital in tracking down important loans. Many insights I share with you emerged during the process of researching and editing the catalog with the distinguished list of authors organized by myself and Kate Neeson, an expert on Twombly sculpture. So imagine them behind me today speaking with me. Now, let's go forward. Yes. I cannot help but note how fitting is this site, a stone acropolis overlooking Los Angeles for displaying Twombly's works in dialogue with antiquity. How shall I start? I need to take you on several journeys. Some are in tandem with Twombly's own life, his early education, his adventures of travel and reading, his life in Italy, but I want to suggest that he's part of an artistic lineage back and forwards. We should not see him as much as out of the American mainstream, art movements, but rather as part of a historic continuum of artistic practices. For over a period of more than 60 years, Cy Twombly developed a singular and profoundly influential, and we should look at Cy, not us, <laughs> approach to abstraction. He explored the limits of painterly mark making by inscribing, I'm oh, sorry, let me start again, sorry, I got myself off, but I want to, Yes, for over a period of more than 60 years, Cy Twombly, 1928 to 2011, developed a singular and profoundly influential approach to abstraction. He explored the limits of painterly mark making by inscribing surfaces with his own handwriting, sometimes illegible, but always recognizable as either a straining toward or slipping away from language. By doing so, he opened a path for art to engage with seemingly narrative subject matter, but using, a <clears throat> sorry, by use, but using largely abstract means. What he achieves is a balance between the rough and the poetic, between the blankness of his white spaces, his erasures, and the density of layered surfaces. Unusual for an American artist at this time, Twombly moved to Rome in 1959. He would maintain a home and studio in Italy for the rest of his life. From the 1960s onward, his art was dominated by a fascination with ancient Mediterranean cultures. This exhibition highlights Twombly's repeated returns to ancient history, archaeology, myth, and poetry. And here I show you Annabelle de Duarte's uh, portrait of him, apparently his favorite portrait of himself. Let me just take some. <clears throat> My focus is on the Greek, Roman, and Egyptian points of his engagements. However, Twombly had wide-ranging tastes for travel and culture. He took several journeys to Iran, North Africa, Afghanistan, 
and spent several winters in Luxor, Egypt. His works also reflect these encounters. Acknowledging this key point, we include at the end of the Getty exhibition a sculpture and photographs commemorating the memorial of Cyrus the Great, who lived in 6th century BCE and who founded the city of Pasargade in southern Iran, which Twombly visited. By the way, Twombly found interesting and amusing the appearance of the letters or sounds of Psy, as in Cyrus, in ancient names and words, and deployed them many times in his works. Yet it is to Greek and Roman culture that he returned most often and consistently throughout his career for inspiration. This exhibition and the accompanying catalog offer a selective survey that explores themes rather than chronology, bringing together Twombly's works across all media in which he worked, sculpture, painting, drawing, photography, and printmaking. Let us take a moment's glance at the art market, realities, <laughs> and visitor reception around Twombly. At Sotheby's in 2017, one of his iconic blackboard paintings from the early 70s went for 36.7 million. Yet most viewers are baffled by his work. The Financial Times entitled their laudatory obituary, Hypnotic Scribbles and Abstract Illusions. He died at age 83 in 2011. Indeed, the so-called scribbles continued to the very end, a description he himself detested. Here's a wax crayon and pencil drawing done in 2003 on a trip to St. Bart's. These all bear the character that Trombley initiated in his early works, namely that described by New Yorker art critic Peter Skidell as loose, gawky glyphs of spiky, unidentifiable flora or fauna, executed in the manner of a guileless, small child. So how do we account for the art world's fascination with this artist? This New Yorker cartoon sums up a long-standing public bias about contemporary art. The clown points at a Jeffrey Koons-like puppy dog and says, I can do that, which pokes fun at the fact that Koons makes the sculpture look like a simplistic concoction of blown up balloons, depending on your point of view, either brilliant or facile. I hope our time together this afternoon and your visit to the exhibition will convince you otherwise. Many have asked how I, as curator of Greek and Roman art, got into this topic. It started when I visited the U.S. exhibition, the first U.S. Ex exhibition of Twombly's sculptures at the National Gallery of Art in 2001. His sculptures are composed from found objects, fragments of wood coated in plaster and white paint. Some of these were later cast in bronze. Occasional pencil markings of titles and fragments of poems hint to his debt to the Mediterranean, especially Greek culture. In fact, a Washington Post critic at the time of the 2001 show scoffed about his hoity-toity, mysterious titles like Thermopylae and Anadiomene. For me, these titles and works resonated, and I was also drawn to his found planks of wood covered in white plaster and paint. The marriage of the lyrical and this rough and ready seems so fresh and yet so like lost ruins. Twombly, who rarely gave interviews or shared thoughts on his praxis, did state that white was his marble. These sculptures bear the atmosphere of the Mediterranean, and as I encountered more of his work over the years, I kept noticing his long and deep engagement with the ancient world through archaeology, poetry, and his own collecting. And you see here the installation at the Pompidou Center retrospective, which was the brilliant work of Jonas Storsby, who's here, uh, the collection of the sculpture in a sort of island. For an artist who's often received and perceived as enigmatic, elusive, inaccessible, we hope this exhibit offers new paths of exploration, namely through the passion for ancient culture. For Boston, this show will, be, will have hometown meaning because Twombly was a student at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts from 1947 to 48. It's quite certain that he spent time with our encyclopedic collections and was particularly engaged with ancient art. He made numerous drawings in 1974 entitled Sesostris II, the name of the Egyptian pharaoh, 
with lotus blue flower prominent in several of them. On this Boston Egyptian faience jar, which you see, there are two of them shown, lotus flowers abound. The lotus appears frequently in Twombly's work because it served as a pictogram for the artist, the W shape of the flower. <clears throat> Outline was a play on the W in his name. In 1950, Twombly attended the Art Students League in New York City and there became close friends with Robert Rauschenberg. Rauschenberg convinced Twombly to attend the Black Mountain College, the legendary innovative art school in North Carolina for both winter and summer sessions in 1951. More on the influence of the great pioneers of poetry, music, and art at this college later. It's lovely to see those youthful portraits, isn't it? His first trip in 1952 was thanks to a travel fellowship of, hold your seats, $1,800 from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Twombly was born in Lexington, Virginia, which he generously shared with his companion, Robert Rauschenberg. They went to Italy and Morocco together. Here he is posing on your left, at age 24 for Rauschenberg's photograph, and he's measuring himself against the index finger of the enormous hand of the lost colossal sculpture of Constantine the Great in the courtyard of the Capitoline Museum. The gesture can imply direction or pause or admonishment, depending on how you want to read it. Also shown is Rauschenberg's provocative photo of Twombly descending 10 of the 124 steps down the Capitol line. We see various parts of Twombly's youthful figure coming into focus, establishing a narrative, time, and desire in the context of a historic Roman site. I found these travel images from his photo archives in Gaeta very intriguing, showing him visiting sites in the 60s, playfully hiding in the ruins of Delos and Santorini. He was with the Franchetti family, more on that, and in Sicily, Selenunte and Agrigento later in 63. All his life, he was a devoted voyager, and the going and coming from port to port plays a key role in his visual imagination and artistic creations. Looking at artists, looking at art, is certainly one dimension of this exhibition, but Twombly also lets us know what he was reading and where he was traveling. The diaristic dimension of his art making is a key feature of his art practice. This rustic sculpture on your left suggests a simple fish fishing boat with an attached oar. The title of his piece, By the Ionian Sea, comes from the title of an early 20th century travelogue of South Italy and Sicily by the English novelist George Gissing. Gissing writes, I quote, the names of Greece and Italy draw me as no others. A quotation in either language thrills me strangely, end of quote. Twombly identified with Gissing's romantic attraction to the places and sounds of his adopted country. Here you see the sweeping views of the Tyrrhenian Sea from his last home and studio in Italy, in Gaeta. Situated on the west coast between Rome and Naples, it still serves as a NATO naval base. Twombly traveled to Italy for extended periods in 52 and 57, and finally moves to Rome in 1959 when he marries Luisa Tatiana Franchetti of the aristocratic art collecting family with roots in Venice. They set up a residence in the historic center of Rome on the Via Monserrato, which their son Alessandro pictured here as a young boy still occupies with his family. And that's a photograph by Horst done for Vogue in 66. Here we have the Getty blowing that photograph up to create a, a maison scene and ambiance of the apartment as a backdrop for the loans of his private collection from Rome. It's thanks to the collaboration and generosity of Alessandro, himself a recognized sculptor, that we have the loan of Twombly's collection of antiquities. 
When the French photographer Annabelle Duarte visited Twombly in 78, she captured the ambiance of these spaces. Through a sight line of doors and halls, we see the bust of Marcus Aurelius. In the foreground are Twombly's drawings of Apollo and Mars. I think you can see it, but maybe I better show you. And uh, there, and the hall sight line, there. <clears throat> leaning against the wall. Annabelle recalls her visit and says it feels like an installation. The ancient sculptures often raised up on columns in dynamic dialogue with both the artist's own paintings and the apartment's architecture. Poet and literary critic Roland Barthes described Twombly's paintings as hot and luminous Mediterranean rooms. Twombly was his favorite artist. In Fall 1990, legendary art collector and founder of Dia Art Foundation and the Menil Museum in Houston visited Twombly in Rome, Dominique de Menil. She and her team were hosted by the artist and his elegant Italian wife, Tatiana, at their Rome apartment, the third floor of a palazzo on the Via Monserrato. Dominique notes in her diary from that day, quote, room after room of sculptures, his and other artists, paintings stacked against the wall and antiquities, sculptures of Marcus Aurelius, Hadrian, and a bust of Venus. The Roman busts with their vertical presence seemed to introduce a philosophical and poetical resonance with Mediterranean culture. That was part of what Sai was painting, she goes on. The protective presence of the sculptures with their tons of white and gray influenced his paintings, end of quote. The result of this visit was the agreement that Menil would build a magnificent pavilion designed by Renzo Piano exclusively for Twombly's works. Robert Rauschenberg recalled that Sai started collecting antiques already back on their first trip abroad. He discovered a flea market. This is a quote from Robert Rauschenberg. He discovered a flea market where farmers would bring in Etruscan things and occasionally a marble bust. He just went crazy. This exhibition is the first time his private collection of ancient art has left his home. He mostly acquired Roman heads, a few divinities, and even the occasional 18th and 19th century replica. And here you see him working on a, a painting and the head observing him of Marcus Aurelius. These were the choices, and I want to say this very clearly, they were not the choices of connoisseur, but rather reflect a taste for the worn and the fragmentary. He's drawn to the weathered surfaces, to the visible processes of deterioration and residues of archeological excavation. These features are enacted in his own work repeatedly. Now I will discuss um, a few early works that reflect his focus on Italy. In 1962, Twombly painted two works with the same title, the, from Lexington, Virginia to Rome, Italy, Blue Ridge Mountains Transfixed by a Roman Piazza. That's the title. He had lived in Italy by then for over three years. This is the work of searching for a geographical identity, a reckoning as he looks back to his youth in the Blue Ridge Mountains and his life in historic Rome linking the two piazzas suspended in his imagination. Looks like it could be a, a difficult dream, too. Suspended there. This painting also reflects Twombly's daily interest in his place, his topos and landscape. He labels many works with the dates and place of their making. In his last 15 years, he moved between Gaeta and Lexington, Virginia. Landscape is, a just gen <clears throat> sorry, landscape is a genre of painting that was precious to Twombly. He most admired Poussin and Turner. Here's a second work with its deep engagement with ancient Rome, however. Twombly's engagement with Roman art was not an art of revival or reinvention, but a psychologically complex interaction. He took on the classical myths and heroes as personal guides. As Twombly wrote for the 1952 fellowship, travel fellowship, for myself of the past, 
For myself, the past is the source for all art and it is vitally contemporary. This is clearly reflected in a way, in the way he arranged his first major New York show at Leo Castelli in 1964. According to Richard Serra, who saw it, a Roman marble bust of the Emperor Commodus was set up in the vestibule with a curtain behind it. And upstairs, there were nine vertical canvases about six feet high, exploding with outbursts of colors, mostly whites and reds, signaling the violence of the disturbed Emperor Commodus, paranoid megalomaniac. Twombly started painting the series around the same time as the assassination of President Kennedy in 63, but there's no firm evidence that this tragic event resulted in this composition. However, it certainly was timely to highlight the madness of power and empire. The New York critics panned the show, calling it a fiasco, but artists such as Bryce Martin and Richard Serra recall being stunned and highly influenced by this show. In an interview with Michael Kimmelman of the New York Times, Sarah said of Twombly, quote, he tackles a giant canvas with a hard pencil and crayon, in which, like Pollock, he goes for a heroic statement, but with little ideograms. I find the vulnerability of Cy Twombly's heroisms compelling. Mysteriously, the whereabouts of this head of Commodus, which Twombly actually acquired in New York City, remains today unknown. This painting is a diagram of Raphael's 1510 fresco titled Il Parnasso. Parnassus is a mountain in central Greece, the legendary home of the Apollo, God Apollo, and the Nine Muses, a place called Arcadia by the ancient Greeks. Twombly draws with heavy pencil lines along the bottom of the contours of the window that is beneath Raphael's painting of the same title in Pope Julius's private chambers. And here I show you um, what I'm talking about because there's the heavy pencil outlining this area of the window. You all following that? Okay. Um, he alludes through splashes of green to the trees and white to the clouds and writes some of the names of the figures in Raphael's painting, Apollo, Muses, Sappho, Dante, as if to sketch his day of viewing <clears throat> and study. By inserting his name, the date, and Raphael's title, and he crosses those out here, so you see the, his name, the date, and the title, Il Parnasso, he puts himself in a direct line of descent from the Italian Renaissance. But more appropriately to our theme, he situates himself with the Greek poets and the muses. So now for a review of some points of influence and inspiration. Early on in our exhibition, you find the monumental grid of 30 drawings only just recently framed and exhibited together. The blue writing-like strokes move from left to right within each panel, impassioned bursts of scrawl that are layered over earlier markings that are no longer visible. In this way, Twombly creates a wall of indecipherable text and an archaeology of surface. I cannot help but ponder the daily life of Twombly in the historic center of Rome as he walked for coffee or gelato break, where he would pass many writings on the ancient walls, both antique inscriptions and contemporary graffitis. Most of these were time-worn writings, consisted of repetitive incisions in stone and dark lines on weathered surfaces. I show you a Greek curse inscription at the MFA, Boston, to evoke the effect of such eroded fragments, which are often unreadable. These inscriptions mimic the tensions between sense and sensibility, between meaning and erasure, that lie at the heart of Twombly's practice. Twombly himself could not read the ancient languages, so when does looking become reading, and reading just part of looking? What might seem at first coded, private, or even exclusionary might instead be an invitation to all of us viewers to employ our imaginations, much as he himself had to. This drawing of 1980 by Twombly is shaped like an ancient stele inscription with a projecting tang at the bottom and I point out with the red hour the tang of a typical Greek inscription. 
So there's one point of reference between his drawing and inscribing from the ancient tradition. And the inscription itself prompted me to find out the meaning and source of these Greek words. Where did he get these words from? I soon discovered that Twombly somehow, we're not sure how he found it, perhaps in a magazine article or a popular book, transcribed the inscription from a famous find at the sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia. That inscription occurs, and I point out in, on the red arrow there, uh, on a bronze Persian helmet captured by the Greeks in the defeat of the Persians. In other words, it's war booty. It reads, dedicated to Zeus by the Athenians, who took it from the Medes, in other words, the Persians. This seems to be a very academic exercise on his part, and one that shows a rather intense interest in archaeological finds. In a remarkable moment of serendipity, the Getty Villa Persian show, which just closed, had the exact helmet on view recently. He would have been pleased. It had never come to the United States before. His work also reflects visits to archaeological sites. Twombly titles this sculpture, Volchi, an important Etruscan site not too far from a country home he had in Latium. Twombly evokes the site not by mapping out the archaeological remains, but by assembling tower-like projections of the 12th century medieval structure at the entrance to the site. And I show you the entrance to the site of Volchi with these towers. The original work was composed of four lengths of dried palm leaf stems that were then cast in bronze. Here you see a reconstruction of a bronze chariot found in a 7th century tomb in Volchi. It bears a resemblance to the types of rustic 18th and 19th century Italian farm carriages that Twombly collected and kept at another summer residence in Bassano and Tevediano. These in turn probably inspired his white painted wood sculptures of 1990 in the exhibition, both meant to evoke motion, a toy, a folly, and maybe a hearkening back to ancient triumphal chariots. And here's the sculpture that is wonderfully uh, displayed here and I think the first time on view publicly. Twombly had a very intimate relationship with his sculptures. He brought them to his various studios in Italy and in Virginia. In other words, he packed them up and carried them to wherever he was going to live. Here is a photo by Sally Mann, his close friend, of the sculpture standing sentinel in his Lexington studio. On the right is a panpipe sculpture uh, in a, a bathroom in Gaeta. These pieces served as his private talismans and must have stimulated his imagination and creative process. I diverge briefly to remind us of an artistic forerunner to Twombly, namely the 19th century sculptor Rodin, who also had a very close relationship with antiquities. He collected thousands of fragments, many of which are still on view at his home museum on the Rue Varenne in Paris. Here, Rodin stands amidst broken torsos that inspired his creations. Many were unusual combinations, like this hand holding a female torso up here, or this head wearing the Acropolis as a hat. Rodin favored his plaster maquettes over the bronze finished and relished the idea of fragments of bodies, the whiteness of the maquettes, and probably was inspired by his antiquities. Note to the pencil markings on this uh, poet and the siren, inscription on the base, Rodin's poet and siren maquette, and Twombly's sculpture with the words eros, binder, and joiner. Both sculptors indulged in found object assemblages, a casualness that converged on being offhand, even sloppy, but also surprisingly beautiful. Now I'd like to review some of the recurring themes in his work. One is naming names. 
Twombly's writings might simply be a single name of a famous Greek or Latin poet. Here, Virgil, on your left, uh, is his most often used literary name, uh, the Greek and Latin. Here, Virgil, his most often used literary name is a race layer over layer, creating a sense of time passing and a pentimento. Consider the insight of Roland Barthes, quote, by writing Virgil on his canvas, Twombly was condensing in his hand the very immensity of Virgil's world, all the references of which his name is the receptacle. And maybe too, through his erasures, the loss to us over time of the value and meaning of those words. And I think for Twombly too, was searching for the value and meaning of those words. In what seems a very self-conscious gesture in a two-part painting, Twombly paints a blue sky as pure as a Raphael and juxtaposes it with a canvas that bears only the name Plato and the titles of his works in pencil, Phaedrus, Symposium, Republic. So, a tricky work. Does he mimic the Surrealists as he does as, um, in this two-part painting in which Magritte creates the name Blue Ciel or Skies. Magritte made a whole series of paintings of cloudy skies as a marker of his unique vision. But why does Trombley invoke Plato in the pendant painting of Blue? Was writing these names an academic exercise, a way to claim knowledge, or to commemorate, as does this Roman relief in the Louvre, showing the seated playwright Euripides with titles of his plays written in columns beside him. Is Twombly indulging himself and finally us as viewers in his own very personal passion with these ancient writers? Are we to view the two-part painting as another nod to Twombly's naming games as with his Virgil drawing? Or does the name Plato stand in for a portrait-like appearance? similar to those displayed in elite Roman villas, those of ancient authors, playwrights, philosophers, in their private libraries, here exemplified by the Getty's Roman bust of Plato. Twombly, in a rare moment of self-revelation, said, quote, I like poets because I can find a condensed phrase, the essence of something. I always look for the phrase. In this unusual photo taken in 1959 by his wife during their summer holidays at Sport Sperlonga, halfway between Rome and Naples, she catches him stretched over a blank ca canvas, dreamily ca gazing out as if to say, will it come today? Will I be inspired today? Early on, Twombly lays out some of his thinking uncharacteristically in this lesser known painting from 1962. I find it telling. He gives us a legend for his use of color by associating dabs of paint with blood, flesh, and clouds. He goes on to create more dabs in a circle and writes out phrases like, white is for diluting dreams. He closes at the bottom of the canvas with a line from a Sappho fragment. But their hearts turn cold and they drop their wings. Sappho's winged ones are the Erodes, the sons of Aphrodite, who pierce us all with arrows of desire and cause joy and sorrow. Sappho movingly describes a moment when they turn against themselves, turn cold and fail to thrive. This is unthinkable in the world of myth, but the poet expresses a poignantly human anxiety about the loss of love. Twombly, like Sappho, recaptures myth for his own personal expressions. Twombly returns often in drawings to the Greek lyric poets of the 7th and 6th centuries BCE, whose verses he read in the 1976 English translation by Guy Davenport. It's a copy from his library that I took visiting his son. His favorites are Sappho, Archilochus, and Alcman. While only fragments remain of their work, these archaic Greek poets are highly admired today for their modern voices because they use the first person I to express immediate passions. They speak to us as if in a present moment. This, I believe, is the key to Twombly's own artistic voice and his lasting contribution. 
He wanted us to join him in the delight of the revelations of the lines emerging from the mists of time, and by writing on his canvases and drawings, he invites us to mouth the words, if only we could read his handwriting. That's my joke, but. <laughs> this 1989 drawing with its fragment from the seventh century Archilochus, quote, hang iambics, this is not the time for poetry takes us into the setting of an all-male Greek drinking party called the Symposium. In pre-literate Greek society, poets and singers recited poetry in iambic meter, especially the lines of Homer. This was, in fact, how the verses of the Iliad and the Odyssey were passed on through generations until they were transcribed centuries later. Archilochus's lines command the reader, the listener, to stop, stop the talking, seize the moment, whether it be for satiation of desire or raucous play, just act, be there. The swirl of the purple and the red paint below references the wine stains of the Dionysiac orgy. This 1988 drawing remains in the whimsical frame chosen by Twombly and was generously loaned by Alessandro. Here the lines from Archilochus phase are, Quote, as one fig tree in a rocky place feeds a lot of crows, easygoing pacify receives a lot of strangers. Curiously, he wipes out the name of pacify. The three purple black long streaks may refer to the crows. What we pick up is a selection of this fragment is Twombly's, in this selection of the fragment, is Twombly's mischievous naughty wit. Pacify is offering her sexual favors or services to many men, the crows, as it were. Many of Twombly's works also bear the lines of Sappho, the great female voice of ancient Greece from the island of Lesbos. Her verses are filled with longing and express much modern thinking that our contemporary poets still turn to her for inspiration. In many fragments, Sappho invokes the great goddess of desire, Aphrodite. Judging by the number and scale of the works Twombly dedicates to the Greek Aphrodite and the Roman Venus, I would say she was his favorite. In his various readings on classical myth, he kept notes, often in the books themselves that he was reading. In this 1975 drawing, he writes in pencil the obscure epithets by which the goddess was known by her followers in different cities and regions of Greece. My favorites are Mopho, the shapely one, actually missing the R, Morpho, and the Epistrophia, or the head twister. The drawing stands as a votive plaque in my mind, honoring the goddess as in the ancient tradition. But it's also serving as a place to record and share his private learning and reading. Aphrodite, as myth instructs, was conceived from the foam and blood spilled upon the sea when her brother Kronos cut off their father Uranos' genitals, all of those Greeks. She first alights on the land of the shores of southwest Cyprus at her holiest site, Paphos. The MFA's rare ceramic perfume bottle of the fourth century BCE illustrates how the Greek artists illustrated her birth. The nude goddess emerges from a shell signaling her birth from the sea, a prefiguration of Botticelli's masterpiece. In Twombly's earliest work honoring Aphrodite, this sculpture of 1959, he uses an artificial leaf painted first white and then red to evoke a shell, an ancient symbol of her sea-born birth. In one of his latest series of paintings, he produced four panels, each nine feet high, and each bearing the phrase, leaving Paphos ringed by waves. The phrase was lifted from a fragment of a lost poem by the 7th century BC Greek poet Alcman, which celebrates Aphrodite. Twombly combines myth and the poet's words to create a journey, one that's blood-soaked because of the violent circumstance of her birth, the boats to and from Paphos, that is, the ancient cult center of Aphrodite. I like to imagine these four panels as Twombly's private chapel to the goddess. As you can see, the shape of the boats mimic wooden boats found in ancient Egyptian tombs, the type that floated along the Nile, carrying goods for the afterlife for their royal inhabitants. We should recall that Twombly spent winters in Luxor on the Nile. And on the right, also here, a uh, special drawing 
called naumachia, the Greek word for naval bottle, and one borrowed from Roman staged amphitheater scenes, sea battles. In scrawling Alcman's words in yellow across the monumental canvases, Twombly cues us to read aloud. He immerses us in a sens sensual vision of paint and word. Sound, ours, the artist, and the poet plays a significant role in our reception of Twombly's works. Some of his emphasis on sound and the implication of our own readings aloud of his writings on canvas, paper, and wood may be traced back to his experience as a student at Black Mountain College in 1951. Twombly attended the college when John Cage and Merce Cunningham taught there. And according to private letter in his archive, Twombly assisted Rauschenberg in making the famous white paintings that served as set design for Cage's theater piece number one, the first happening, first recorded happening, an unscripted performance with dancers and musicians and Cage standing on a ladder delivering a lecture. Another participant in the pioneering happening performance was Charles Olson, a Black Mountain teacher and poet. As Twombly observed, the college revolved around Olson. His theories about verse involved breath and the concept of a speech force in language which imbues the poetry with energy. Olson called this his projective verse theory. Note how Olson laid out his poems in this slide. He demanded that his poems have a visual impact. The interdisciplinary nature of art produced at Black Mountain, where writing, painting, and performing merged, no doubt enlightened Twombly. We see this in his experiments in automatic writing, layers of white paint, and the random interplay of wood, word, image, and sound, which all inspired him. Twombly's Orpheus paintings and drawings, inspired by his readings of the Orpheus sonnets by German poet Rainer Maria Rilke, clearly demonstrates the evocation of sound in his art. The focus of this nine foot long painting is the O that is three feet high and occupies the mental space of the painting. The descending letters of the name of Orpheus mimic the mythical hero's own descent to Hades, his rescue of his wife Eurydice, or his attempted rescue. The O invites us to open our mouths and emit sound, and not unlike what ancient theater masks similarly evoked, this mask in his own collection. Twombly's large expenses of white paint incorporate silences, spaces, gaps, fragments, erasure, all energize Twombly's works as we can project into them. They invite us to fill the stage and perform vocally. So, the other divinity in which Twombly was devoted was the god of war, Ares in Greek, Mars in Latin. Historic and mythical battles inspired several titles and compositions, and blood red drips across the 1960s canvases. Perhaps his response um, as an expatriate to the civil unrest and the violent assassinations in the US in the 60s. This large drawing entitled Mars and the Artists declares Twombly as aligned with the god of war. He puts his lotus sign, his personal ideogram there, his, uh, there you go, that's that lotus we talked about, uh, which he associates with the W-like shape of the flower with the W in his name. And about half of his personal collection is uh, involved with ancient armor. Here are Brown's, bronze helmet and breastplate. And the subject of one of his masterworks, 50 Days at Ilium, occupies an entire room at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, 10 painting cycle that was inspired by his reading of Alexander Pope's 18th century English translation of the Iliad. Twombly noted that he misspelled Ilium, purposely replacing the U with an A to see if anyone would notice. But by respelling, he's also laying claim to his own text an act he repeated in several other works. This monumental suite of painting is a culmination of many years of drawing studies and paintings based on the readings of the great war epic, the Iliad. His favorite ancient warrior was Achilles. Perhaps this was because Achilles was a bisexual figure in ancient myth or because he expressed anger so dramatically and consistently. I would not want to veer off into the murky waters of cycle logical analysis, 
but it does seem fair to say that Twombly was obsessed by Achilles. For whatever reason, Twombly produced several drawings and large-scale paintings. One painting now in Berlin I show you here is nine foot long with only the letter A to honor Achilles. The A takes the form of a large red-shaped flame or rocket or arrow or spear. Some critics see this as an aggressive phallic imagery. Twombly also turned to Roman political history to find more bloody themes for his canvases, especially in the 60s. Here, the death of Pompey, a painting refers to the beheading in 48 BCE in Alexandria of the Roman general Pompey, once Julius Caesar's ally, but later his enemy. The red bulging circular shapes, perhaps an abstraction of the terrifying head dripping in blood, sit atop a masonry built funeral pyre Notice Twombly's own red smudged handprint at the lower left corner. But how did Twombly come up with this theme? My research led me to conclude that Twombly was reading an English translation of the Alexandrian Greek poet, Constantine Kafafi. Kafafi died in 1933, little known, but he is now much heralded as a great world poet whose verses, quote, hold the historical and the erotic in a single embrace, as keenly observed by a recent translator, Daniel Mendelssohn. Pompey's executioner, Theodotus, gives his name to Kofafi's poem, which portends that we too may be ignorant of the terrifying acts of violence, such as a beheading of Pompey, that take place in our time and must and should be witnessed. Twombly takes several titles and themes directly from Kafafi's poems for other works. One of his more widely quoted poems, Thermopylae, is the subject of a Twombly sculpture constructed of plaster over wicker in 1992 and then copied in bronze. The plaster original pencils lines from the Kafafi poem, the arrow points, honor to those who in Honor to those who in the life they lead define and guard a Thermopylae, which applies to anyone who takes a stand for what they believe and defend what they love. Thermopylae, the gates of fire, was a mountain pass and a site of a legendary standoff between the small Spartan force and a massive invading Persian army in 48, 480 BCE. It lives long in the annals of military history as a universal symbol of bravery. This page, taken from a marked up copy of Twombly's book of translation of Kafafi's poems, bears his sketch of the Thermopylae sculpture. He was thinking about making. It's clear that his reading was intimately tied to his art making. We must account for this when looking at Twombly. The weaving of word and image sets a strong direction for understanding his work. The last bit I want to talk appropriately about memorials. The creation of memorials is part of sculpture making. Feed, fittingly, he turns to the Greek tradition of using tall vertical pillars or stele, which mark the graves of their notable citizens to make his sculptures. Here I show you the Getty installation with their Greek uh, stele is on this drawing, which we'll discuss. Twombly creates several sculptures that are memorial-like in their intent and shape. Earlier in the lecture, we saw the memorial for the Persian prince Cyrus the Great. Twombly thus makes his contribution to the universal rituals of burial and commemoration. In this collage drawing of 1975, Twombly combines an L shape of paper cut out with the penciled writings from the romantic sh poet Shelley. The verses commemorate the death of Keats. I write the verses out for you so you can read them. Whom he likens to the mythic handsome young man Adonis, Aphrodite's lover. The abstract vertical shape suits Twombly's project of memorialization. And you see, I, he writes, I weep for Adonis, he is dead. Again, poetry helps guide his enterprise. As director Tim Potts questioned me, what's with these lemons? You, dear viewer, might also ask, why is this memorial in the show? What is ancient about this? 
It says, <clears throat> and I said, yet in many ways, this humble construction of the wood, found wood planks, roughly put together, have penciled words. In time, the wind will come and destroy my lemons. It speaks poignantly of Twombly's preoccupations about what remains and what's lost. The lemons refer to a grove of trees planted by himself with Nicola in uh, Gaeta, and they were indeed blown over in a bad storm. But rather than simply memorializing his beloved lemons, Twombly finds a bold and more universal loss to share with us. The lemon acts as an image reference to the German poet scholar Goethe, whose late 18th century journey to Italy describes the land where lemons blossom. The land where lemon blossoms blow, excuse me. Twombly was a close reader of Goethe's Italian account. The modest rustic epitaph is Twombly's gesture to a universal memorial to our shared futures of inevitable, inevitable demise and the nostalgia for our endeavors. His own memorial erected in Rome's Chiesa Nuova recalls his birthplace, Lexington, Virginia, and his proper name, Edwin Parker. His nickname was Cy after the legendary baseball player Cy Young. But I do not want to end on this mournful note, so I will remind us that there are younger generation of artists in his debt. One artist who openly acknowledged this and has achieved great fame is Jean-Michel Basquiat. As art critic René Ricard Riley observed, if Cy Twombly and Jean Dubuffet had a baby and gave it up for adoption, it would be Jean-Michel Basquiat. And indeed, in this painting entitled Jawbone, Jaw, <laughs> Jawbone of an Ass from 1982, Basquiat inscribes long lists of Greek and Roman historic figures, battles, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Vesuvius, Hannibal, um, Spartacus, Scipio. So you can see that. And then in his Floyd O'Brien painting of 1987, you see the application of layers of white and gray paint smears and the references to melody and writings of songs puts you in a Twombly frame of mind. In these few stills I took, by, uh, I took in viewing the 16 millimeter film of Tacita Dean entitled Pan Amicus, just commissioned by the Getty, the British artist reveals a similar relation to antiquity. The stone fragments from the Getty Villa collections placed in rustic landscapes helped to mark the passage of the day from sunrise to moonrise. Tacita and Twombly were friends in these later years, and she made a film about him in the studio. It seems most fitting that, one, that she, Tacita, has been artist in residence at the Getty when the exhibition opened. So let's close with this fit, favorite photo of himself by Annabelle Duarte. For Twombly, there persisted a living continuity between material remains of the ancient world and the artist's own daily discourses and his own encounters. In Twombly's hands, what we might consider rarefied subject matter became his own vernacular. He made the past present by appropriation, reinterpretation, and a very deep reckoning with time. His homage to the ancient and modern poets speak directly to our shared human emotions, our longings and disappointments. And I hope you will agree that his ability to radically unleash language upon abstraction deserves our highest regard. Thank you. <laughs>